there because we hadn't actually achieved it at that stage. But this year, fast forward one year, now we have the sports science that we previously had to back it up. But we have another year of knowledge, Stephen, and we have a year now of people actually achieving 20% and more. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the key point because we've been literally working with hundreds and hundreds. There's no other coaching business that has such a big, broad range of customer base to kind of field test this stuff with. So who is this webinar for, okay? So if you've limited time to train, as we've mentioned, this is absolutely going to benefit you. If you really want to improve as a cyclist, I guarantee you, you are going to get something off this webinar. If you found that last season didn't go to plan, we're going to show you some really critical things that you can zone in on to improve, to make sure that you don't have a repeat next year, you don't stay at a plateau. Because if you're looking for guidance, if you've really reached a point where you're not sure that what you're doing is right or uh, it's going to get you to your goals, we're going to help you tonight. And we're going to introduce you to Barry Murray Anto, who's going to really talk about just, it's not even low-hanging fruit, like you trip over the solo uh, in terms of improving your cycling performance through power to weight. Yeah, Barry's going to join us a little bit later on, so that's worth staying tuned for to the end. Barry's the ex-BMC nutritionist, and Barry has incredible, incredible knowledge and strategies that are just really going to challenge everything you thought you knew about, you know, how to feel for a training ride, what to eat in a race. So, to be honest, the first time I met him, he absolutely blew my mind. Yeah, but you came off a fairly low base of eating shit, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, you know, you have a dig at the champ. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, we, we, we recently polled people. So if you're in a situation, you're looking at this and you say, I don't have enough time to train, like I'm training, you know, the maximum amount I can, I'm trying to fit rides in and here and there, but I'm not improving. Well, we've designed this program specifically around for you. If you find yourself getting sick and injured, and there's a whole multitude of reasons why that might happen, Anthony, whether you're overtraining in the winter, whether you're introducing too much training load too soon, too early in the new year, these are things that we see people do over and over again because they don't know how to build the proper training structure, building towards uh, the right season, You know, not following a proven plan, not hitting their ideal weight. These are all things we're going to cover tonight in the webinar. Yeah, I think it's safe to say if you follow our system, and that is exactly what we have, Stephen, it's a system, it's a step-by-step, -step. but also I think tonight we're really going to just try and cut through a lot of bullshit for people, and we're going to give you really actionable insights that whether you decide to sign up for our system or you decide to just tune in for the hour, you're going to have stuff you can take away and really avoid a lot of the common mistakes people are making, like the, the notable ones that are on screen. Yeah, so I want to ask everyone watching this question, and I mean, it's that time of year, Anthony, when you're going to start reflecting on your cycling performance on your previous season, hopefully setting some goals towards a new season, but, you know, so many of us, you know, really fail to reach our true potential in cycling. I mean, we I'll show you a case study later of Richard, like, he improved his functional threshold by something like 60% by just understanding what training to do, and I think if anyone's watching this and you think, I've plateaued, I'm not doing what I think I should do, not reaching my potential, now you've got to do something about it. You've got to take action, and especially implementing some of the stuff that we're going to teach you on tonight's webinar, Anthony. Yes, yeah, Stephen. I, the, the big thing, why people are making these gains is, previously, if I rewind you know, 10 years ago when I was getting into the sport, this level of sport science and data analytics was available to maybe one or two of the world's elite cyclists. And they were getting you know, 5 10% gains out of it in that area. But now if you fast forward and you apply this level of sports science and analytics to your everyday club cyclists, the gains are absolutely astonishing. They really are. So honestly, the solution is within this webinar. So over the next hour, we're going to share with you three training secrets that will be a game changer for your performance. So the first one is high intensity, ditching the junk miles and embracing scientifically proven high intensity program. And we're going to give you the exact training week so you can really understand what do those sessions look like. We're also going to show you the three critical things that you need to train if you really want to improve as a cyclist. And that's your functional threshold power, your VO2 max, and really working on a sprint, which is not only for the benefit of sprinting, Anthony, it's going to help you for those surges and accelerations that can really fatigue you if you haven't trained for that in a race. Yeah, just one simple example to illustrate, Stephen, if you know, you're on a, a circuit with four corners and you're covering that 10 times, you know, you have 40 accelerations to make out of a corner. Now, if I can only sprint at 1,000 watts and I need to sprint at 100% of my capacity to hold the wheel out of every corner, that starts taking its toll, whereas if I'm sprinting at 1,000 watts and my capacity is 1,400 watts, that's taking much less out of me, I mean I have more for the finish of the race, whether that's to attack solo, follow moves, or ultimately win a bunch of sprints. 
Yeah, and secret number three is power to weight ratio. And make sure you stay to the end because we're going to introduce Barry, who's probably going to make you challenge absolutely everything that you thought you knew about diet and nutrition, Anthony. Yeah, yeah, Barry is one of the world's foremost authorities on sports nutrition and specifically cycling nutrition. And he's definitely challenging a lot of the conventional wisdoms and you know, even simple things like Stephen, we spoke off air, like a lot of people will start their morning riot on a Saturday with a big bowl of porridge. Barry's gonna tell you exactly why you're maybe undermining your own uh, battle to lose fat doing that. Absolutely. So um, just on the right, you've got your question box. We've already got a, a question from Jess, and yes, we will be sending out the recording, but any questions you have, pop it in there, and we'll definitely ensure that we answer all your questions over the course of the next hour, because we really, as Anthony said, will you sign up for the program or not? We will be making an offer at the end of this. We want to be straight up about it, but I guarantee you, by the time that comes, we will have really challenged not only your thinking, but your planning for your training next year. So why listen to me? So Anthony... For those of you that really follow A1 members, A1 uh, coaching and the Irish cycling scene, Anto, you need no introduction? I do need no introduction. No, no. Uh, yeah, so I transitioned, sort of stumbling my way around, uh, went to law school, wasn't for me, and tried to carve a career as a professional cyclist. But when I was abroad, uh, I established A1 coaching, and soon that began to really spread and built an amazing team out of you know, 12 coaches, sports scientists, in-house nutritionists, and we're the largest coaching company in Europe at the moment. But we're really niching down, Stephen, and focusing on serving, you know, not the professional riders, we're focusing on serving those time-crunched athletes, you know, men and women who are struggling to balance work-life with their training, and we're getting those guys phenomenal results at the moment. Yeah, and I mean, I'm your target market, that's me on the right, and, uh, you know, I am the sweet spot for A1 coaching. We've... Uh, really designed a program to suit people with busy lives. I run a big construction conglomerate and trying to fit my racing and training in around a busy lifestyle. So we really understand um, what your challenges are because when we started out, Anthony, we did a lot of things right, but we also did a lot of things wrong. You know, we overtrained, we got burned out, we did the wrong things, we didn't know what really to do in terms of following a proven system, possibly like a lot of people that are watching this now. And we understand the frustration that that can cause someone Stephen, I engaged in basically this big, long, drawn-out game of trial and error where I would go on a 12-month trial of one entire calendar year and I would try something like, you know, we'll talk about Barry's fat adapted. I'd read about that and go, oh, I'll try that. And I'd, you know, read the information, maybe absorb 60 70% of it, maybe implement another 50% of that, and I'd get to the end of the season and go, okay, well, I learned a couple of lessons there, but I'm not actually that much better. And this happened over a period of years until I began to develop a system. It was actually a pro tour friend of mine let me into this. He's like, you know what, there is actually a process, and the process is, you know, X, Y, and Z. And once we followed that process, then the results just became amazing. And so I started to roll out that process then to, you know, clients and subsequently to the wider audience and A1 members. And it's been astonishing results. Absolutely, yeah. So the hard way is no proven system to follow. Lots of training, but frustrated with progress. Sorry there. Um, you know, overtraining and feeling burned out. Not sure that it, what you're doing is going to work. Becoming demotivated and disillusioned, and we see that so often. You know, especially when things aren't going to plan at the at the start of the year. Um, so we want to kill some big myths around training at the moment. First one is that you need to train 10 to 15 hours a week to be successful. You absolutely don't. That's absolutely not a requirement. The second myth is that you cannot do high intensity in the winter, and we're going to really debunk that. Uh, in a minute. Um, the third one is that you can be successful riding on field without having a plan. Um, and the fourth one is that you don't have to train event specific. It doesn't matter what your event is, whether it's a race, a sportif, you absolutely have to uh, introduce some very, very race or sportif specific elements into your training. So Anto, just explain to people, you know, secret number one, high intensity, but you know, you have a mission against the whole thing of junk miles. Yeah, Stephen, it's one of the areas that when clients come into me, it's probably the number one area when I see clients coming in and they haven't been following a program before, that they're going out the door without a specific purpose. So we term that as junk miles. You're going out without a specific reason. You know, if you're doing anything, Stephen runs a successful construction company, and every single thing he does, A, action is lined up to achieve B, results. But a lot of us just get out the door on the bike and we go for a bit of a spin with no real goal. You know, we're, there's a range of zones, and each of the zones, you get a different physiological adaptation from training in that zone. But if you're just going out the door and you're riding around 
aimlessly, you're getting one very narrow set of physiological adaptations. You're not training, you know, say sprints, neuromuscular adaptation is the, what we'd be looking for, but you're not achieving that. So it's just going out and it's pure waste of time, Stephen, pure junk. Yeah, so I mean, ask yourself a question and really challenge your thinking over the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. Are you guilty of engaging in junk miles? And we're going to really explain exactly what that is in a second. Because I think years ago, Anthony, uh, people thought they could train, uh, sorry, you know, people's perception of winter training is based primarily on what the pros did 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, and Stephen, even in the last, you know, Joe Friel uh, wrote the Cyclist Training Bible, I think that was about 10 years ago, and that's a, you know, a seminal piece of work among coaches. It's a, it's a great book. Hats off to Joe Friel for writing it. But one of the things he talks about in that is your base needs to be wired to achieve a high peak. And, you know, if we're talking about guys here, myself included and yourself included, Stephen, where we have fixed duration <clears throat> for training, we can only train six to eight hours a week. That's all we are able to train before other areas of our life start to suffer. So if we look at a fixed duration, how can we build this wide base that Joe Friel is talking about that Eddie Merckx used to do? So it's reinterpreting what it means by a wide base. And a wide base actually means now, in my opinion, high TSS load. And high TSS load means training stress score. That can be achieved through a combination of duration and intensity. So if you can't do the 15, 20 hour training weeks, you need to add in some intensity, splice the intensity into it, and that's how we can build the base, the wide base. Yeah, yeah, and I think the core word there is splice. You've got to really understand, A, how you introduce that intensity, what intensity, what level of intensity, and that, you know, we'll explain in a minute. You'll see it in the perfect winter training week, because the biggest problem that we see is that concept of headless chicken riding, and, you know, you know what we mean by that is, Anthony, not knowing your zones, yeah, like I briefly touched upon there, Stephen, each one of the zones are set up to achieve a very specific adaptation. So if you're going out the door today, so ask yourself now this question. When you went out for your ride this morning or when you went out for your ride on the weekend, did you have a definite goal for that ride? Were you looking to improve? Were you looking to improve your endurance? Were you looking to improve your threshold? Were you looking to improve your anaerobic capacity, your neuromuscular adaptation? If you don't know what you're going out to improve, it's an absolute waste of time. So if you don't know your zones, you don't know the intensity you need to train at to make that improvement and that adaptation. So that's school by error number one I see is people not knowing their zones and not knowing how to set their zones. Second one is Strava man and this is something we see so often Anto, the really number one wrong metric of how people judge their cycling performance. Well Stephen you touched on it there with this idea of splicing intensity into training. So Strava is predicated on this idea that we need to ride around fast all the time or we need to ride around fast on segments. Now that segment may not line up with our objectives for the day. Like if I'm out on an endurance ride, there's no value in me being plotted on a Strava segment. And again, even the whole concept of riding with Strava, it's fundamentally flawed from a training perspective, Stephen, because I'm being plotted on a group, of, on a leaderboard against others, and I'm being made to feel like less about my accomplishments because I'm plotted on a leaderboard against full-time pros. So actually I had a old man, actually my current team manager, uh, he might be listening, he had an article where he was talking about if you're sprinting for a non-existent finish line against an imaginary opponent on a country road for a non-existent prize, you need your head examined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the third one is constantly riding around in zone three, and we really get into this uh, inside A1 members, and there's a load of blogs. If you just Google uh, A1 coaching, how to set your zones, you'll easily find some blogs, and in fact, we might even post it in the chat box. But really, what riding in zone three, just imagine the scenario I'm painting here now. Just ask yourself, is this me? You've got an hour and a half to train. You know, you're, you get home on a Tuesday evening, you get up on the bike, and you just mash it. From the minute you get on, you're riding, you know, not full gas, obviously, but really fairly hard. If you've got two hours to train, it's the same level. If you've got three hours to train, you're trying to keep that same level, constantly pushing. And, and what that means is you're going to become a single speed engine, and we see it so often, people that can drone away forever, you know, 20, 21 miles an hour or 30 to 32 kilometers an hour, and they kill the likes of me and you out training. But when it comes to a racer, or a sportif, they can't cope with surges in speed because they haven't trained or created that adaptability in their cycling performance. 
you know, Stephen, I'm almost a part of me is willing to give these guys a pass because intuitively riding around in zone three makes sense. So let me paint a picture for you, Stephen. You, you don't know. We never met. You never had access to coaching. And you're going out, you're ambitious, but you're time crunched. So you have an hour to do or you have 90 minutes available training when you get home from work. Intuitively, your gut reaction is, I have 90 minutes available. I need to get out and make the most of that. And what that typically means for most of us is, you know, one hour riding at zone four is threshold. That's the most we're able to do. So highly motivated, zone three is the most we can achieve for a 90 minute ride. So we just go out the door and we literally ride as hard as we can for the duration of the session thinking that's the best way to maximize our available time. But as Stephen yeah. touched on there, that's the best way to ensure you only have one speed. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, you're not you know, going to not get fit, but what you're not going to do is create that adaptability in your cycling performance where you can just do really, really high intensity, uh, you know, two to three minute efforts, which we'll talk about in a second. So, you know, the big mistake is riding around in zone two or zone three where you're constantly creating a high level of training stress which over time is going to really impact on you and you're going to really not develop the full range so this is going to bring us straight into secret number two the critical things that you need to train which is the actual total opposite anto of riding around in zone three Stephen, this is going out with structure. This is leaving the house with a purpose, with a plan. You're not going out. Like we see people in our members group, and they're, they have a detailed prescription. It's like a shopping list they're going out the door with. They're not going out the door going for a little ride around the block. This is very focused training with a very specific goal. Um, these are the three critical elements you need to train. They're functional threshold power, VO2 max, and a sprint. So I want to touch briefly on why you would want to train each of these. You know, when we talk about functional threshold power, you often hear people saying, Stephen, you know, I want to get to the next level. And for me, working with thousands of clients now, we've managed to reach through A1 coaching and A1 members. Getting to the next level means higher thresholds. If you have a higher threshold, it's going to take you from cat four to cat three to cat two to cat one. Higher threshold, higher threshold every time. Yeah, so put in really simple terms, your functional threshold is your kind of hardest pace that you, not kindly, the hardest pace that you can maintain for an hour. Um, and we work everything off a percentage of either your functional threshold heart rate or your functional threshold power rate. And as Anto said, like, I mean, if you're looking at the guys in the Tour de France and you hear them talking about their numbers, and then you also hear them talk about them going into the red, and to what they're really saying is they're going above their functional threshold power, which you can only maintain for a couple of minutes. So going above it uh, and you're going to blow going too low below it and you're not going to create that level of adaptation where you're raising your functional threshold power so you're increasing your ability to ride faster further for longer and why it wins races Stephen like I can ride along in the, the local bunch or the local sportif and if we're doing 40 kilometers an hour and I have a functional threshold of 380 watts you're riding beside me and we're the same weight you have a functional threshold power of 300 watts for us to be in the same bunch proportionally it's taking a lot less out of me than it is out of you so when it comes time to, for the selection in the race whether that be on the hill or challenging crosswind section I have a lot more in reserve than you do to kick above that functional threshold power so it's energy management almost it's giving me a bigger engine so I have a bigger engine than you and anyone Stephen I know you're a big petrol head like the importance <laughs> of a bigger engine is just immense yeah I mean, the way that Joe Friel brilliantly describes it in his book, The Training Bible, it's like you've got a box of matches, and you've got 20 matches in that you can strike, and you can use them at will, but once they're gone, they're gone. So let's imagine you have a functional threshold heart rate of 175. Each and every time you go above that, even for a very short period of time, you're striking a match, and what's happening is you're accumulating fatigue, you're accumulating lactate, you're, you're just getting fatigued, essentially, and eventually, at some point, until you're just not going to have any more matches to strike and that's what really you know is the breaking point for most people and especially most of the people that come into our program to say oh you know I, I went to sprint at the end and I just couldn't sprint and they think it's because they don't have a sprint but the reality is they've just burned all their matches hello Sorry, Stephen, there I lost my microphone for a second. Yes, yeah, so Joe Friel put it brilliantly with that analogy of the matches. So that leads us into, you know, this is something that we have to do. We have to raise our functional threshold power. So everybody wants to know, how can I raise it? So there's two real ways you can raise it. There's one training above your threshold, which is going to pull your threshold up. And there's another training just below your threshold, which is going to push your threshold up. Now, 
both are equally relevant and both are sprinkled into our training program across the whole season. But if you're not training just below it or just above it, you're not going to achieve any increase in your functional threshold power and you're going to remain stagnant at the same level. So how do you raise your functional threshold? First of all, you've got to know it. So you've got to do the dreaded functional threshold test. And again, if you just Google A1 coaching, how to set my functional threshold, um, and we'll send it out uh, afterwards, you know, you're going to find out it's torture. And so it's, it's probably the most horrible aspect of our training, but it's so crucial because unless you know what your functional threshold heart rate or your functional threshold uh, power is, you, you won't know if you're training at that right level. Yeah, Stephen, I had a guy emailing me earlier on and he was doing everything he could to try and get out with his functional threshold test. He was sending me on all power files. I was in the lab and I'd done this. I was like, go test, go test. Have you watched a video on setting your zones? He's like, I have watched it, I have watched it, but it sounds hard. I was like, it is hard, but it's a baseline. It needs to be done. It's our starting point. So we use this analogy, Stephen, when you get into the car, your GPS wants to know two things. Where are you and where are you going? And then it can plot the route. So it's the exact same. The starting point is this test, our functional threshold test. We design all our zones as a percentage of that, and we plot all our progress as a percentage of this also. So it's completely crucial. OK, so some of the questions coming through. Um, typically, how many hours a week should an elite rider been training over the winter? So um, elite, for me, uh, you, well, we've developed our programs. Last year, we really only had a a uh, single base and a single build program, which is all based around eight hours a week. And what we found is as people have passed through our programs, they've just improved. So ultimately, as Anthony explained at the very outset of this uh, presentation, really training intensity is all about the development and the accumulation of training stress, and it's a function of intensity and time. So ultimately, at a certain point, Anto, you have to increase the, the volume of training, the time that you're spending on the bike if you want to see continued improvements and adaptation. So we've kind of pushed our advanced program out now in some weeks up to 12 week, uh, hours a week. Yeah, it depends on the level, Stephen. Like, you know, some of the guys here, there's one guy coming in, and he was working as a one-on-one -on -one client, and he's seen a 6% increase in his FTP last season. You know, 6% can going to be an absolutely huge increase in your FTP when you're at a certain level. You know, you see the guys like Chris Froom, Contador, those guys aren't getting a 1% increase season on season. So when you're an elite guy like that, uh, we uh, have added the new training plan this year where it's a little more than eight hours a week because if you are a cat one rider, and you're looking to win the biggest races in the country. But I haven't said that, Stephen. I worked off the A1 members plan last year of eight hours a week as I was you know, very busy growing A1 coach and the apps that we're working on. And I followed that for eight weeks leading into a stage of Ross Moon, which is one of the biggest stage races in Ireland. I managed to win the Queen stage and second on the last stage. So you, know, you can go a long way in the elite races uh, off the eight hour plan, but I would recommend if somebody's a cat one that they kick it up to our advanced plan. Yeah, I mean, I won seven races in a season following this off eight hours a week, so it is possible to be competitive, um, especially for you know some of the shorter races, uh, which are my kind of speciality. Another thing as well, and I see this all the time, you know, the old diesel engines. Um, I mean, there's one guy who comes to mind, he's a really good friend of mine, and he destroys me out training, to be honest. And the one thing that he doesn't have is any, you know, training of his VO2 max effort. So what he typically finds is on a three to five minute hill or that tough drag or that really super intense period in a crit, he's just at the back end toe. So what is your VO2 max? And again, what, why does it win races? What is so important about it? So we talked about functional threshold power, but we all know if anybody's a student at a sport or you're racing in Cat 4 and Cat 3, you'll notice there's that guy who sits on the front who seems to be able to ride at 40 kilometers an hour, 42 kilometers an hour all day, but he doesn't win the race. And then he you know, cries about people are being dishonest and you know, I was the strongest there. And maybe he was the strongest there in that he had the highest functional threshold power. But what he failed to realize is functional threshold power alone won't win your races unless you throw a cap one rider into a cap four race. They're not going to be able to get separation from a bunch with just functional threshold power alone. So you need to have a high VO2 max. So that's the ability to work above thresholds. And VO2 max, Stephen, if you think about it, it's going to get me that separation. So if the bunch behind is doing 40 kilometers an hour, I need to get a separation. If I can get 30 seconds on that bunch, and now I can ride at 40 kilometers an hour, I only need to ride the same speed as the pursuing bunch, and I'll maintain that gap. But the VO2 max is going to allow me to pull out that 30 seconds. That's where VO2 max is really going to come in. 
Yeah, and VO two max is as much mental as it is physical in terms of training it, Anthony. You know, um, if you haven't trained that ability to really push yourself above your functional threshold for three to five minutes, um, you, you know, you're not training yourself mentally to suffer, to deal with it, to kind of process it. So it's very unlikely you're going to find some miraculous way of doing it in your key event. Yeah, it just won't happen. If, if you don't practice things in training, they won't miraculously happen on race day. You'll get into the race, you won't be able to get that separation, or you'll get into the break, you won't be able to distance yourself from your breakaway companions, and you're just going to end up in big bunches. Typically, a way to notice somebody who hasn't got good VO2 max is they end up in a lot of big bunches. If guys have high VO2 max power, they're able to make that separation, and then they can ride at threshold or below threshold when they're in a group. And often, Stephen, you can get away with a, quite a low relative threshold if you have a high VO2 max because you can get into the break and then it's typically a lot easier in the break than it is in the bunch because the bunch is surging and it's slowing down, it's surging and slowing down whereas the break is an easy true and off for the day normally. Yeah, so there's a question, please keep your questions coming, we really want nobody to leave this webinar tonight without but having had their question answered, I'd like to improve my climbing. Long steep hills like 14% gradient. This is really relevant over one mile long. At the moment, I can't keep my cadence high enough, and it's very difficult. How do I train for that? Exactly what we've been talking about. So hill climbing is all about a function of one of two things, including power to weight, which will come up, uh, you know, over in, in a couple of minutes. But functional threshold, because you want to be at a level where you're not going into the red, because you can only maintain that for three to five minutes, and then for the really steep parts, having that VO2 max effort ability, Anthony. Yeah, if it's like a one mile climb that you're just looking to pin it, and you're looking to get you know, a hill climb record, as you're looking to get a separation from a group in a race, or maybe you're even just looking to get up it, and that's your, your level at the moment, that's all going to be VO2 max. You know, one mile where we 1.6k up a hill, those four minute type efforts are going to be perfect for you. So the VO2 max efforts we'd recommend for you would be something like get out for a one hour session, but in that one hour session, you're going to include something like four by four minutes as hard as you can go. And that means as hard as you can go as an evenly paced as hard as you can go for the four minutes. So like a four minute time trial, trying to get four of them into a session with maybe a four minute break in between. And a lot of them sessions are very similar to stuff we have in our training plans. Yeah, and so how hard is hard? Believe you me, within 30 seconds, you'll know you're doing that interval. After a minute and a half, you'll think, if I had a minute left to live, I'll do one of these intervals, because they seem to go on forever. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty bloody hard, but you've got to be able to maintain the effort for the entire duration. So it's, it's you know, anywhere from two to five minute full gas efforts. You've got to be completely, I wouldn't say empty, but really creating a full, even effort answer for the duration of the interval. Yeah, it's evenly paced the case, Stephen. You don't want to see people going out at you know, 1,200 watts or 10 out of 10 effort and then scale it back to a 7 out of 10 effort. It's got to be evenly paced distribution across the entire duration of the effort. So this brings us to the next critical thing that you've got to think about improving, your strength and your sprint. Um, because it wins races, it deals with you know, the surges that Anthony spoke about. It's going to make you more efficient on the bike, it's going to improve your muscular endurance, your efficiency, that ability to turn bigger gears, you know, it can only benefit you, and there's nothing more destroying than you come in in a group of six, Anto, and you're the six <laughs> across the line, because you, you just haven't developed any sprint, it's just such a critical part of cycling. Yeah, no, Stephen, I finished fifth out of a three-man break before. <laughs> I got, the, lads, the lads popped out of a corner, I got distance out of that, and then I got caught by two guys coming in the line after being away all day. So the joke is I got fifth out of a three-man break because I wasn't working on my sprint at the time. No, it's absolutely, and you know, the, the really great thing about cycling is, you know, we all come in sh different shapes and sizes, and uh, whilst I wouldn't consider myself like an out-and-out well, out sprinter, I have for my you know, weight a pretty pretty strong sprint. And the cool thing about it is like, you know, unless I was riding with, you know, some of the really, really good A1s uh, or cat ones, they, they find it almost impossible to get rid of me. But then I've got the sprint and the ability to just come around them and, 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 and get up on the line. So it's it's something, whether you're already a good sprinter, you should improve. If you haven't worked on your sprint, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. So Obviously, it's, it's, it's understandable why it wins races. So how do you train it? We, we focus on a number of things, and there's a question come through that I'm going to touch on, and that's we do three things really. On the bike, strength training, so that's low gear hill reps, and uh, if you live in a flat area, getting it up into a massive gear anto and riding at a low cadence into the wind. If um, <clears throat> you're just joining our base program, 
Aaron Bogler, our coach in A1, has put together a specific strength plan, which really deals with the periodization, you know, so heavyweights at the start, moving to polymetrics for your explosiveness, and then obviously improving speed work. We do a lot of pedal and rep work, Anto. Yeah, so there's actually, that's in response to one of the questions there. It's about uh, low cadence intervals, a uh, five minute interval at 50 RPM at threshold. So that's on the bike strength specific work and the old theory would it used to be, you know, there's no point in going to the gym because it's not cycling specific. Uh, we can do this on the bike instead. But actually the research has moved away from that, Stephen. It's now shown that we can get into the gym and if us as time crunched athletes, we're better off putting that strength work in the gym than we are on the bike. Yes, we can get the adaptations on the bike, but it takes slightly longer. By all means, you don't have to do the gym, but are you leaving percentage gains on the table if you don't go to the gym? Yes, definitely. Yeah, um, really good question has just come through. Is there a better time during the winter to do a functional threshold training versus VO2 max training? So that's a really good point to bring in how that ideal winter training program is structured. So at A1 Coaching, we follow the, 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 the model of a 12-week base, which is three distinct months with very, very distinct training objectives, Anthony, for each of the months. And then as we move into the 10-week build, so typically at the start of the base, Anthony, we're all about improving efficiency, aerobic endurance, muscular strength and muscular endurance. And then as we transition towards the end of the base uh, up into the build, we're starting to work on more VO2 max efforts. Yes, yeah, Stephen, I suppose it would be very difficult to categorize the system we're using in traditional. Uh, so, you know, traditional coaching would have been a very much moving from the general to the specific as we get closer to the race. And while we're still doing a lot of that, we are embracing a lot of this emerging science called reverse periodization, where we're adding intensity into the base, into the base period as well. So you will find yourself in the base period we're working on threshold. We'll have little elements of VO2 max in the base period as well. And it's every session is designed with a specific goal in mind. So you'll be very clear going out the door when you're following our system. Okay, today I'm working on my threshold. Today I'm working on my VO2 max. So what is the you know, impact of these type of sessions? So Ian came to us last year. He was one of the first to sign up for the winter training program. This is over the base period. Body fat down from 21 to 14 percent. Lean mass up by 2 kilograms. Functional threshold up 40 watts. And um, we had Richard, which really blew my mind. He went from 210, so Richard came off a fairly low base. He was um, really one of these people that we get from time to time inside A1 where they haven't been training with any structure and he went up to an absolutely mind-boggling 340 watts and we've got absolutely dozens and dozens of these types of testimonials and obviously it brings us nicely into the third point. I mean we spoke about you know having got all the feedback from our customers, having surveyed a number of times and to one of the things that kept coming up over and over again and it talks to all that we've just been shown in terms of case studies and it's power to weight ratio people struggling to get down to their ideal uh, racing weight and also we really want to challenge some of the misinformation uh, around sports nutrition so we reached out uh, to work with Barry yeah, Stephen, uh, listen, our whole program, it's predicated upon this. We can get you massive gains of eight hours per week. So if you think about our average client, eight hours per week, what's he doing when he's off the bike is more important than what he's doing when he's on the bike. So, uh, you know, with a year of case studies, this quickly became evident for us that there's a huge low-hanging fruit of what you guys were doing off the bike. So we teamed up with, you know, when me and Stephen talked about getting a nutrition expert involved, I said, you know, uh, Great, I like the idea in a, as a concept, but unless we can get the best sports nutritionist in the game, I don't want to put our name to it. And we managed to reach out and managed to get Barry Murray, and I'm super excited. He's a gent of a man, and he's, you know, for me, he's the industry leader in sports nutrition for cyclists. So Barry, you on the line there? Yes, I'm waiting patiently here for you, lads. <laughs> After that rousing introduction, uh, welcome. Great to have you on board. Great, yeah. Thanks for thanks for inviting me, lads. So I guess we, you know, we, I kind of I kind of theme this the journey of discovery, really, because I, I guess that's what it is, really. And and a lot of people when they come into this uh, aspect of this understanding about nutrition, it it really makes them question everything that they've uh, heard before. So when did you realise, uh, Barry, that everything we know might be wrong? Yeah, I mean, I studied chemistry first in um, university, and that then I went and studied nutrition. And I, I used my chemistry to kind of look really deep into the nutrition, and it, it allowed me to 
sort of um, kind of look past the the surface, so to speak. And um, when I started looking into the kind of biochemistry of what was actually happening inside our bodies, it, 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 there was a few things I thought that were being overlooked. And I guess when I really realized that, you know, the current guidelines or the traditional guidelines weren't even, they weren't, not only were they not matching with the, what I was looking at in the theory, but then I was practicing it in the real world. Like I was, um, I was cycling, doing triathlons, ultra marathon running myself. And then the sooner, this, the, the more I worked then with other cyclists and other athletes, and the more I was applying my principles, so to speak, um, well, that's when I was really finding that, you know, what the book was saying or what the guidelines were saying were not meeting what my scientific understanding was, was showing me, nor was it, nor was it meet, meeting up with uh, what I was actually doing in the field. So what were some of the fundamental things? Can you kind of contextualize that for people? Was it challenging what you were eating before, during, and after your workouts? Or was it looking at the various kind of food sources that most people think, and we see, and it really drives me crazy, like young kids coming into the sport that think they need two energy gels before they hop on and do a 50-minute or a, an hour-long race? Yeah, so the main thing first was like the requirement for a massive carbohydrate intake no matter what kind of athlete you are. So um, I was, again, I was studying, you know, I was doing my master's and I was looking at 8 to 10 grams per kilo of body weight for, you know, what that's the recommendation for an endurance, the full-time training endurance athlete. So, you know, if you're 80 kilos and you're taking 10 grams per kilo, um, you know, that's 800 grams. Now, for anyone, who, for people who don't know what that looks like, 800 grams is like 10 big bowls of, of porridge or, or 10 bowls of rice a day. You know, so yeah. in, initially, what I actually tried to do was I actually tried to follow the guidelines. I remember one time calculating what I had to consume, you know, something like 600 grams of carbohydrate, and I actually physically couldn't act. Never mind, like the fact that it didn't work. It actually was practically quite difficult to do. So, and um, I was like competing and training and and working with with clients, and um, none of us were able to get you know really get close to the requirements and yet we were still performing and doing better so that was my first indication that a lower carbohydrate than recommended is is actually better for you and works better and then I started looking at the general food base that is recommended for as you said like the standard sports drink gel and massive carbohydrate loads massive amount of fruits massive amount of rices massive amount of breads and a lot of the foods that you know, people are being instructed to eat are simply not good for you. You know, it's like it, it, what was available to us today um, was not available to us, you know, 50, 100 years ago. We're, we're eating bagels today and gels. Um, you know, you go back a couple of hundred years ago and those things aren't obviously available. So I started looking into the kind of ancestral approach to food and, you know, it was, without getting into the details, um, what our grandmothers and grandfathers ate was a lot healthier for you than what were what were what's available to us in the supermarkets today. Yeah, because I mean, for a lot of people watching this, that that, that this concept is new. I mean, we are as human beings exceptionally ineffective at processing uh, sugar, Barry. So any type of refined carbohydrate is broken down very very quickly by the body into sugar, and uh, I think what a lot of people fail to realize is that. That can do a lot of damage in terms of creating insulin resistance, perhaps type 2 diabetes, but even just the onset of free radicals in the body because we're putting so much stress and strain because of this constant intake of sugar. Yeah, so one of the key things I started studying first was the effect of sugar and glucose um, on our hormonal system. Um, and also what enzymes it triggers. So I don't look at a plate of food as being calories. I look at it as being a, a, plate of, a plate of switches and triggers. And one of the things that glucose does is it switches on the hormone um, insulin. And as you know then, insulin is very important for a variety of reasons, but one of the things it does is it controls your blood sugar levels. It also controls how you store fats and store protein. So um, when you are consuming a very high carbohydrate diet, you're running you're running insulin down on a continuous basis, especially when you're eating high quick release type sugars, which are found in most foods people are eating. People don't people forget that sweets, you know, are sugar, but so is rice and so is potato in terms of its end 
endpoint is still the same molecule as what comes from a packet of sweets. And that's a big thing people don't understand. Yeah. So if you're consuming all of these foods, like the breads, like the rices, like the pastas, and the bananas, and the other fruits on a constant, constant basis, then, then, then topping up with various sports drinks and gels and other high, high sugar type foods, um, insulin loses its ability to function properly. And that's what leads to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And there's a massive movement in some countries now about reducing the carbohydrate requirements because the carbohydrate recommendations are, you know, 7 to 11 servings a day of, the, of these foods. So um, I showed that if you become more fat adapted and by using your fat as your predominant fu primary fuel source, then, then you simply not only have a bigger engine, but you get healthier. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, Professor um, Patrick Halford from the UK who founded the Institute of Optimum Nutrition, you know, he described it like rocket fuel. You know, we get up in the morning, we have a, you know, a cup of coffee, a couple of slices of toast with jam on, we have a bagel at half ten, you know, we have a sweet, and you're constantly, constantly surging. And, uh, your body with the sugar level and, and a lot of what we do is, uh, as amateur athletes is exactly that you know we have a very starchy very carby uh, breakfast we're constantly feeding carbs whether it's through a drink or gels during the ride often unnecessarily right and then we're getting in and we're stuffing more carbs in uh, to ourselves because we think that's what we need to do in our recovery ride and it, it not only is it bad but it also very much depends on your body makeup and the type of workout that you're doing yeah, absolutely. I mean, unfortunately, you know, while um, it's important to state that um, what I'm recommending is, is not as, you know, it's not that people, you know, 100% give up carbohydrate as, as a food, but certainly in terms of the, the general requirements that people think they need, and then secondly, based on the intensity of the ride that you're doing, they, they're the sort of things that you should be dictating uh, the quantities that you have and you should be what's termed earning your carbohydrates so you know um, people going out for a 90 minute recovery spin and um, don't need to be looking back uh, two or 300 grams of, of, of carbohydrate in the forms of drinks and fruits and breads and rices um, so it's really important to put to put the context around what people are doing you know yeah, so someone's asked a really good, very timely, relevant question, you know, <clears throat> how do I reduce carbs but still have enough energy to ride the training plan? So that kind of brings us to point three, the whole concept of becoming fat adapted, Barry. Yeah, so the key thing to this, the most important word that I can use is gradual, okay? So every time I talk about this, let's call it pathway or, or mechanism, um, it has to be done and you can't switch overnight and you can't even switch within a week. It needs to be done over several weeks if not months. Therefore, you need to gradually you know, reduce your carbohydrate, switch to the type of carbohydrate foods that you're eating from, from things like white rice to things like uh, quinoa or quinoa and get off things like standard cereals and you know, start, start eating you know, uh, things like porridge in lower quantities and much lower glycemic index foods. So the gradual process allows the adaptations to take place. Um, but the key thing, the biggest mistake I see people making is they they, they cut out things like breads and, and, and white rice and stuff like that. But the fuel source that people have to keep remembering is that the fuel source that you need is, is fat. And therefore, your fat consumption from an energy balance point of view has to drastically also increase. So um, I find the biggest mistake people make when they're switching to this kind of way of eating is simply not eating enough fats. And it's a hard thing to do because we've been brainwashed into thinking that fats are bad for you and fats make you gain weight. Um, but, um, you know, if you saw generally kind of a daily diet of my, my um, what's on my plate, I mean, the most, let's call it the most food that's on my plate is, is fat. And that will be in the form of anything from you know, fatty meats to eggs to avocados to um, to coconut oils and nuts and and even the heavier heavier fats like the creams and the creme fraiches. Um, so, you know, that's the big thing people have. It's two major things that this switch over needs is one is a gradual reduction, weeks, stroke, months of a reduction in your carbohydrate intake. But secondly, an increase, an equal increase in your in your the daily fats in your diet. 
Yeah, absolutely. You actually answered a question that someone asked there about some fat examples. Um, I mean, fish, eggs, oil, coconut oil, you know, these are all really available sources uh, now. I mean, I, I remember, you know, when I went uh, originally kind of full and completely and totally paleo uh, eight, eight, seven and eight years ago, it was hard to get things like coconut uh, oil in in stores, whereas now you can go into the local super value and buy coconut oil. It's really accessible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, um, I, like the hardest thing that people, um, the, one of the hardest lessons people need to understand is that, you know, things like saturated fats are actually the fats that we should be eating more of. So I'm putting things like extra butter on my vegetables, for example. Um, I'm asking the butcher to give me the fattier cut of pork and the fattier cut of beef. I don't want lean cuts. I want the actual saturated fat cuts. So this is a hard thing for people to, to understand, but it's crucial actually to to your you know to your actually it's crucial to your health, but also crucial to making your body adapted to burning fats. Yeah, and there's a whole movement. I mean, in South Africa, led by Professor Tim Noakes, um, who really was the first of the sports scientists, uh, you know, to kind of put up his hand and say, "Hey, I got this wrong." You know, he he was one of the proponents originally 20 years ago of carb loading, and they realised the effect that was having in terms of people becoming, uh, in, you know, insulin intolerant and diabetic and unable to lose that weight. And I think so many people, especially once you reach the wrong end of 40, Barry, they kind of wonder why they can't lose that two or three kilos or that kind of tire around their middle, but it's often because of that reason. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, apart from the fact that this makes, it improves your efficiency, your economy, and makes, allows you to grow a bigger engine, so to speak, um, it does make you long-term healthier because it's a lower inflammatory type way of eating, um, and it, it actually saves you in the long run from, you know, um, serious illness. So, um, it's a win-win situation. It's going to actually improve your fat burning capabilities, which will naturally reduce your body fat levels. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for six or seven years myself, and I have been able to maintain um, my body, comp my weight, and um, you know, I very rarely fluctuate. I don't gain body fat. If anything, it's very hard to actually for me to maintain my weight. It keeps on going down. Yet I'm eating more fat than anyone else I know. So. Um, it's you know it's um, it seems contrary to a lot of the you know standard conventional wisdom let's call it but um, more and more in the le in the public and even at the academic level like you said Professor Tim Noakes it's coming up it's coming out you know several years ago I was looked on as a bit of a, a bit of a black sheep and nowadays it's becoming at least more recognised. Yeah. So I guess the question then that comes to a lot of people's minds, and we've touched on it, are carbohydrates still important? So Anto, you've been going through this process yourself. How have you find uh, how are you finding the adaptation? Yeah, I was actually uh, met Barry earlier on for lunch. We met for lunch. I kind of did feel a little bit like I was on trial at lunch as we were going through the lunch. <laughs> I had to make the important choices, or the I could feel Barry's eyes burning a judgment into the back of my head. Um, it's, it's been surprisingly good, Stephen. I was just talking to Barry about this earlier. I rode this morning for about three hours, and I went away. One of the things Barry advocates in his system is no breakfast on some of the rides, just starting the day with an espresso to switch on the fat burning. And typically, I think, Barry, you recommend starting to eat after about 90 minutes? Yeah. So I went through today, and actually, I left it longer than 90 minutes. I nearly got the full three hours without eating and I still wasn't that hungry whereas before I would have been reaching for I would have been reaching for a cereal bar, a Mars bar, whatever I had in my pocket after 20, 30 minutes, even after having a big breakfast, like a big bowl of porridge, which would have been my staple before going out. But all it was doing was spiking the blood sugar and causing me to crave more and more sugar. And I, I actually depended on it. I would have been one of those riders now that was stopping uh, midway through a session and nailing cans of Coke and chocolate bars and stuff just to keep going. And, stage races as well, always back to the car and picking up cans of coke just to keep the blood sugar topped up. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, and there's some really interesting questions coming through that talk about a lot of our conditioning and, you know, this is challenging people. I've followed this program um, for, for years and I've found my levels of 
my weight dropped from 82 to 68 kg and maintained that my levels of inflammation were a fraction of what they were. I won a shitload of races. I was just far healthier, far happier um, than I had been on my diet prior to, to, to going on this. Um, I think one of the big things for me, Stephen, was uh, one of the big things for me was the cravings are gone. I yeah. used to be one of those guys. Now, even I was trying to out train a bad diet basically for the last ten years, and I yeah. had a diet like a fat guy, but I was training to a level that was allowing me to burn this stuff off. But now as I start to scale back my training and I didn't change my eating habits, I found I was putting on a kilogram extra each season. But my diet typically when before I started working with Barry would have been a sugary cereal in the morning that was spiking the blood sugar, you know, wraps, baguettes, bagels throughout the day. But I would have always found myself needing chocolate bars for pick me ups during the day with a cup of tea or coffee, relying heavily on stimulants focused on that unsustainable sort of energy all the time. And that's basically been eradicated four weeks into this diet, which has been a revelation for me. But some good questions, Barry, I want to pose here, because they really talk to people's concerns. Um, it's really strange to hear someone advocating eating fat. Uh, more and more people will have to take statins to reduce their cardiovascular risk if we decide to eat full fats again. Does a high-fat dairy intake lead to heart disease later in life? Um, do you, you know, you, I know what your comment is going to be, but just give your answer to some of those common questions and concerns. Yeah, hard to answer them uh, in 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 a uh, thirty seconds. But um, look, the, these sort of controversial in, in, uh, issues have been um, have been uh, very publicly actually um, discussed and argued over the last several years. I mean, there's actually a lot of big doctors now, particularly in the UK, and a lot of a lot of studies, a lot of meta a meta analysis where they you know they study of several kind of investigations or papers um, showing that there's there's no correlation between uh, dietary fat intake and, and heart disease um, or cardiovascular issues. Um, so everything related to cholesterol, everything related to saturated fat, um, you know, there are, as I said, <laughs> there is a lot more to this, but I mean, there are several books written on this, like the cholesterol controversy, and there's a brand, you know, like a very well-written book on um, Big Fat Lies um, by a U.S. Uh, journalist, uh, female, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And then, of course, you've got people like Professor Tim Noakes um, um, and other, other researchers in the States who are showing that there's no link between high fat intake, um, dietary fat, and car cardiovascular or heart disease. Yeah, a really accessible book is The Paleo Solution by Rob Wolf, which uh, does go a little bit into the science and breaks it down and um, actually backs up a lot of what Barry's been saying by scientific research. So what would the fueling strategy for people be, um, Barry? You know, what would they eat before the ride, during the ride, um, especially if they're doing high intensity intervals on the ride, and what would they eat as a recovery? Well, again, I mean, I guess going in tandem with what, what, what your guys are doing with the training and, and um, you know, uh, try to go against convention, um, I would recommend most people's long rides they shouldn't eat anything before it. Now, um, first of all, again, I would do this in a gradual manner. I wouldn't go out on your your long, long your biggest long five-hour ride, um, and if you've never done something like this before. But if you are going out on a you know what is a general endurance um, two and a half three-hour kind of a ride, um, if you go out what I call on empty or if you go out with no breakfast, you're actually going out in a bigger fat burning state because by not consuming any food prior to that, uh, prior to you getting on the bike, you're actually opening up your fat burning system way more. Okay, so I mean, I like I said, I've doing this several years myself, and lots of cyclists I've worked with have been doing it. And um, but people think that they need to eat something for fuel when when you look inside the body and you look at the pathways of how you make energy. We've got a lot of fuel in us, and the way of actually accessing that, the best way of accessing that in the morning, particularly, is by not eating. So, um, a black coffee of any description, um, you know, the caffeine and, and some other, other compounds within the coffee can actually help with the fat burning. Um, but a glass of water and a black coffee is, is generally what my my long ride breakfast recommendation would be. The second best thing I would say would be a high fat 
stroke protein type breakfast. Again, by not consuming carbohydrates, you're allowing the body's fat metabolism to open up. So um, eating scrambled eggs um, and scrambled eggs and bacon actually is better for you than a bowl of porridge if you want to access your fat for that long ride. And if you want to get the adaptations um, from burning to burn fat from that ride. So they're my two best breakfasts um, prior to a long ride. Um, either, either nothing or, or a, an egg stroke bacon type, um, an eggs based type breakfast. And during the, um, ride, during the ride, if people have gone, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. During the ride, my, I'm not as controversial because I don't feel that um, you do not continue to have to eat butter and eggs during when you're on the bike because once your fat metabolism, your fat burning engine is switched on, um, eating something like a piece of fruit, a banana, or a rice cake, or a bar, or something like that. Um, in in terms of simple carbohydrates, they, they don't switch off fat burning because insulin remains dormant during exercise. So consuming simple carbohydrates during your ride is absolutely fine. I mean, the only little kind of um, let's say add-on that I that I advise is maybe waiting a bit longer into the ride to to eat just to really um, get the adaptations in the, uh, going. So. Um, you know, I don't recommend cans of Coke and gels, but there's, you know, certainly natural foods are, you know, absolutely fine to eat on the bike, and you don't have to stay off carbs during during exercise. Because I mean, the benefits of power to weight are just enormous, Anthony. I mean, you know, uh, one kilogram over a ten kilometer climb, I think, equates to one minute. Is it? Yeah, it's one minute up a 10 kilometer climb if you keep everything else consistent. But Stephen, if you look at most of the clients we're working on, most of you guys listening in tonight, you're going to lose a lot more than one kilogram. Like, it's Barry will talk you through in our system how you can check your body fat percentage, but most of us can comfortably lose four or five kilograms without, you know, I always hear clients come in and they say, oh, you know, I don't want to look like Chris Froome, and you're like, I don't want to ride the Tour de France, and you're like, okay, well, don't worry, you're not going to ride the Tour de France. <laughs> let's, let's put that aside for a minute. You can lose four or five kilograms, look healthier, feel better, five kilograms is going to get you up to 10 kilometer climb five minutes faster. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, this isn't small gains, it's it's massive. I went down from 82 kilograms to 68 and maintained at a pretty even level, which meant my power output, my max power output went from, I think it was 17 and a half watts per kilo up to just shy of 21. Like, that's an absolute game changer. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't actually difficult for me to do. I, I certainly didn't struggle. So if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by this information obviously there's a full program inside A1 members where you can go through and there's step-by-step -step videos and guides and programs there's also just a wealth of great from Ben Greenfield's books to Rob to Professor Tim Noakes I know you're a big fan of Mark's Daily Apple as well um, Barry yeah yeah I mean he's written a book called Primal Endurance which I get a mention in and um he would, I don't know which way to say this, but he would follow, yeah, either I follow him or he would, he would follow along my principles and uh, he's been in the game for quite a long time. Yeah, so um, really appreciate you coming on uh, board, Barry. Uh, great to have you working with a lot of our guys already inside A1 members and look forward to the next couple of months and seeing the results that people are going to get uh, if they follow the program. Yeah, great. I mean, the thing that I, I guess I'll just finish with here is that what I like what A1, um, got, the A1 coaching is doing is like you're trying to connect the dots. It's like I'm realizing that there's a few branches to the tree. tree. So, um, you know, today in today's world, we can get caught up just with our, our parameters and, and, and training, but uh, there's there's lots more to it, and that's it's great that you guys are trying to bring in a few uh, a few of the disciplines and, and, and getting people to kind of, um, you know, connect the dots like I said and that's the way of getting better today is like not just looking at one thing it's it's uh, having a, a, a cumulative approach I guess. Brilliant. Thanks a million Barry, really appreciate it and kind of brings us on to the next point because um, our focus on these three elements um, have allowed us over the last year alone work with over 1,100 athletes and they've been achieving life-changing results and we're not talking about people winning the Tour de France Anto, like we mentioned or like you mentioned a minute ago we're talking about people like Ben who went from I think it was 120 kg down to 80 
Yeah, Ben, it's been a ridiculous story, Stephen, and Ben is just one of those amazing transformation stories where it's somebody who just bought wholeheartedly into the program and followed it step by step, just trusted us, because if you do trust us on this journey, you will see these results. And Ben bought into the, like Barry was saying there, I don't like the word holistic, but that's almost what it was, this you know, multifaceted approach of training, strength and conditioning, diet, and the results were just spectacular, as you can see from the photo on the left to the photo on the right. Yeah, absolutely. Transformation is only the only other word for it. Like in Brian, I mean, Brian is already like Brian was already extremely fit coming in onto the program. Still managed to up his functional threshold power uh, by 15%. But his son managed to raise his functional threshold up by by 21%. Uh, percent. Daryl, who came through with us, increased his functional threshold by 59%, uh, and that's all within a couple of weeks. And he managed to knock. Um, an entire hour off his target sportif events. So this structured approach by focusing on the three secrets that we've really advocated, which is high intensity, which is training the three critical elements, and looking at your power to weight, and really managing and moving more towards holistic foods. So we've got cookbooks uh, inside A1 members, and you will not find one single process thing. And people are cooking the recipes, Anto, and getting absolutely rave reviews as a result of it and there's not one single thing in those cookbooks that you can't buy in either the vegetable section or the meat section or wherever of your local supermarket. Yeah, it's back to basics, Stephen. There's no gadgets here, there's no you know trickery, there's no magic sauce. This is just consistency. We're going to give you a system from the cookbooks to all that other stuff that if you put it in place, you'll get the results like Daryl. But also, Stephen, it's good to people to, to point out that we actually were giving a number of free handouts away because, like we said, we wanted to give you guys some actionable stuff today that even if you decide not to sign up for our system that you can take away and you can start to implement. So five simple steps to becoming fat adapted is a must read. Our zone calculator is in there as a free download today. You can check out our perfect winter training week as well. So Stephen, this is all great stuff people should take, but you need to take action on it rather than just taking and looking at it. Yeah, information alone is absolutely not going to help you get to where you want to go to. And that kind of brings us on to this point. I mean, if you guys and girls watching this want to see these kind of results, we want to make it available to you. So if you would like help in all of this, um, if you would like us, myself and Anthony and the team, Aaron and Steve and all of the support staff inside A1 members to help you personally, We'd like to give you this exact formula for success because there's a lot of information that we've given tonight. There's a lot of moving parts, and especially around the diet and nutrition. Now, I'm going to come back to some of the questions in a minute. Um, but the, the trick is, if you're working with someone you know, who's already achieved success or already understands how to apply these things, your chance of being successful in applying them is infinitely higher. I mean, the success guru, Tony Robbins, said, Anto, if you just want to f be successful at something, find someone who's already achieved that success and emulate them. Yeah, so we, like we've clients, Stephen, that are sportive clients all the way up to pro riders working off our systems. So almost regardless of what your target is next season, we have a, advice and mentorship which we can say to you, listen, here's a person with your very similar background and they've achieved this level of success. Here's a step-by-step -step system. Follow this and you will, no questions asked, achieve that same level of success. Yeah, because what we've done, which is pretty unique, is we've created a private members area called A1 Members. And inside it, we've not only, as Barry was saying, looked at training, and it's not all about heart rates and parameters. It's much more holistic than that. It's looking at training plans. It's looking at diet and nutrition plans, and not just around cycling performance, but around lifestyle and health. Uh, we've got also programs to explain any aspect of your cycling training and cycling performance, whether it's how to train with a parameter, heart meters, whether it's race tactics, but more importantly, mindset and motivation and work-life balance, how to balance whole training programs about how to balance your training program around your busy lifestyle. Because I think the main thing, and even you know, if I was to be totally honest, Anthony, when we set out about it, you know, we had a, an idea that this is what we wanted to create, but we genuinely have created the biggest community of motivated and committed cyclists supporting, encouraging, and motivating each other. It's astonishing, Stephen. You know, as you and Barry were talking there, I just even flicked on briefly onto our forum, and you can just see all the time the content's populating. It's user-generated content. Users are coming back, they're talking to each other about their challenges, and then coaches are pitching in with it, and it's constant and it's ongoing. It's just turned into this amazing, amazing community. 
So if you're on your own, if you're looking to improve your cycling performance, wondering what to do, not sure of exactly if what you're doing is right or wrong, you know, this is a community that you can reach out to. So, you know, it's a fully inclusive holistic training program with training plans. We've got the A1 Engage, which is the Facebook group. You can store all your training data there. We've got private members only webinars where we do really deep dives into specific member challenges and you know getting people ready for things like their target events and sportifs. So what do you get inside A1 members? Well you get 24-7, seven, seven days a week coaching guidance, all our specific training programs. You can store all your training data and upload um, your training rides, keep the data there, also set up groups and do group rides even virtually if some of the other members are in other areas. You get access to all of the cookbooks, recipes for the road, one and two, and inside the bid on, our mindset and motivation program, our interactive season planner. There's over 50 details, and it's growing every single month of videos, and we've added a load of new videos over the last two to three months if you've been in A1 and are looking to renew. And then, obviously, our members-only workshops, which we'll be recommencing in two weeks' time. I mean, an absolutely mind-boggling array of value. But the biggest bonus, Anthony, is access to the private Facebook group that you've just alluded to, which is really developing a life of its own. You seem to have lost Anthony there briefly. No, I mean, no you're back there. Second step. Yeah, I was just saying, one of the biggest bonuses, Anthony, is access to the A1 members private Facebook group, which is just this amazing, organic, active, uh, private community of cyclists in there 24-7 supporting each other. Yeah, you'll almost always get a, a similar background to you. You know, I always think, Stephen, if you're looking for a reason not to succeed in life, you'll typically find one. But in here, you'll find somebody with the exact same set of circumstances you have, and they'll have succeeded. And it's just, it pulls you through. You know, we have this saying in cycling that misery loves companionship. And that's what it is. Like, if you're struggling to get through some of the intervals, if you're struggling, you know, with a goal, you know, one of our members, Anne Slater, in a recent video where she was saying, she was saying a couple of times she fell off the wagon and she even had A1 coaches reaching out to her personally in her Facebook saying, you know, Anne, what's all going on with you? I haven't heard from you in a long time. And that's what it is. People are invested in each other and it's becoming, you know, a really collegiality is the name of the game in there. It's a real amazing support group. We're also going to be running uh, webinars once a month where we're going to get really deep down into certain topics and especially around things like how to avoid burnout, how to manage fatigue, how to focus on your key event, how to really optimize your training, how to optimize your diet. And those are things that we'll be rolling out every single month over the next couple of months. So you're going to all of what I mentioned before, the access to the training programs, the ability to store your data, cycling cookbooks, mindset and motivation, Barry's, uh, nutrition program which in itself is hugely value worth hundreds of euro I mean people pay Barry for one-on-one -on -one coaching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of euro a month all of the detailed uh, videos and at this point you've got two choices you can obviously do nothing take the information that we've given today and hopefully apply it and I really hope you get some use out of it because that's what we wanted with this webinar the second option is obviously make a small investment compared to the amazing value you're going to get at return and just give A1 members a shot and if it works for you, great. If not, just ask for your money back because at this point, if all that joining A1 members did was finally give you direction in your training, that would surely be worth it. Whether it allowed you get upgraded or get that hour off your sportive target time, whatever your personal goals are, that surely would be worth it. Whatever your cycling dreams and goals are, achieving them, Anthony, I mean, Get on our success wall. There's dozens of testimonials there of people not necessarily winning the Tour de France, as you said, but just you know beating their mates, beating their sportive time, getting upgraded, winning races. It's just really cool to see. If you're looking to maximize your available training time, Stephen, if you're looking at it like a training investment, you're putting something in and you want to get something back out. You're putting your most valuable commodity into this time. And if you want to get a result back out of that, improve fitness, weight loss, more strength, but we didn't even mention our strength and conditioning plan, which has been developed with one of our top coaches with uh, the physiology department with DCU, and this is an amazing, you know, takes all the guesswork out of strength training, so it gives you this absolute clarity and peace of mind, Stephen, for me, and that's probably the number one benefit. Absolutely. So, I mean, if that was a 3,000 investment, I mean, think of all the money you've spent on cycling things like bloody aero helmets and wheels and stuff like that. I mean it isn't going to give you one-tenth of the level of gains that you could expect to get. And we're offering all of this 12 months, 24-7 access 
for a one-time payment of 97 for 12 months of support and direction. And you won't have to wonder again what you should be doing, whether it's with your training, your strength and conditioning, your nutrition, whether to how to avoid burnout, setting your goals, getting focused, because you'll know you're getting the maximum return out of your time invested. And what's the catch there isn't? You get 12 months access for 97, which is a 59% discount of our normal price. And in fact, when you click through to the link, which I'm showing you there, www.a1members.com forward slash bike radar, we even give a two week trial for one euro, just so you can really minimize your risk of maybe you're not still quite sure what is this membership site we're talking about, what is the information available in there. Well, we totally de-risk it for you on two levels. One is because we give a full money back guarantee and two, we give you access for one euro for two week trial after which you can either upgrade to the annual one time payment or a monthly subscription of 20 euro a month. I mean, it's less than 30 cents a day. I mean, think of how much you probably spend every day on a coffee or a Starbucks. And as I mentioned, if you go for the one time payment in 97, there's a 30 day unequivocal money back guarantee. If you at any time in the next month say this isn't for me, you just basically cancel with a one-time click and we will refund uh, your 97 euro. So I guess, Anthony, at this point, it's just a simple question. I mean, if you really want to improve as a cyclist, surely it's worth taking this tiny leap of faith and joining A1 members. Stephen, for me, it's an absolute no-brainer and you don't get many no-brainers in cycling. Like, I was down in the bike shop earlier on and I bought two new winter tires, pretty much the two, new, two worst tires on the market and it cost me 104 euro you know, for two winter tires. To think that we're giving access to Barry Murray, who was working with BMC, you know, he's working with Steve Cummings, Philip Gilbert, we're giving access to that, the strength and conditioning plan with the videos, all our training plans, the videos on mindset, motivation, all of that for less than the price of the two crappy winter tires I bought today earlier on, that's absolutely baffling for me. I mean, John has just posted, A1 members has been the best investment I have made. Thanks, John, I appreciate it. That's exactly why we put this on. So, you know, this is all about breaking old habits and being super successful because everything that we've talked about in the webinar, everything that we've put together inside A1 members is all based on cutting edge science. We are constantly investing in our program, in what we do, in the people that we work with to give you the most cutting edge um, science in terms of sports science so that you can maximize your training. But information alone isn't going to solve your problem. You know, you need the step-by-step -step systems and templates and training programs and all of that. And that's absolutely fantastic. But more importantly, you need the mentoring and accountability. Who's going to be there to see over your shoulders to whether you're really actually getting that gain, which is what the Facebook group is all about. We're going to hold your hand, Stephen, on this journey, and we've held your hand for thousands, over a thousand members last year and watched them achieve their goals. And for me, Stephen, the cycling benefits are brilliant, but they're ancillary benefits. Like It's hugely rewarding for me. So I got an email off a client of ours the other day, and he wasn't comfortable coming forward. He was in his late 60s. He said he's lost weight. He's given him more mobility, more confidence. That's huge life-changing stuff. Again, another client who we didn't talk about, Nikhil Nershman, lost 40 kilograms, said it completely changed his life. You know, gave him the confidence to get a new job, approach a different girl, and it's completely changed the direction of his life off a 97 euro investment. And I don't even think I'm overselling that at all. No, honestly, I mean, whatever your goal is, if you want to get upgraded, if you're looking to win races, be the sporty time, or you're just looking to be healthy again, you're looking to reduce your weight, reduce the inflammation, maybe get rid of other debilitating uh, issues that you have. I mean, we have every spectrum inside A1 members, and for less than two euro a week, you're going to get total peace of mind knowing that you're following the exact sessions and training you need in order to peak for your key event. Um, so what's next? All you've got to do is go to www.a1members.com forward slash bike radar and I'm sure Steve is going to put it in the chat box so you can click on the link directly and then you make that one time payment even at that point if you're still a bit concerned just go for the one euro trial and after two weeks you'll be automatically upgraded to the monthly subscription or you can go at that point for a one time payment and you'll have immediate access to all of the training join the Facebook group get in and see for yourself what it's all about so at this stage, Anto, you've got one of two choices. I know which one I'd take. 
Yeah, Stephen, it's a sport where we do end up wasting a lot of money, and it's a sport where we end up wasting a lot of time. And time is the one commodity, Stephen, that we can't get back. You know, at the end of every month, your wages come in, your money is back again. But once you spend that time, it's gone. So I see clients every year they come into us and they're frustrated that they've spent five, six years trying to figure this out on themselves. And that's five, six years that are waste. They're never getting back. We're going to hold your hand and give you this step-by-step -step system. That's the path for me. It's an absolute no-brainer. Yeah, so thank you so much for attending the webinar. We're so grateful. If you've got any further questions, you can drop me a message on Skype. I'm stephen.duggan11 or drop a mail at info at a1members.com. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, basically, uh, hi, Anton, Stephen, great webinar. Question for Barry. I think Barry's gone, but I can answer this, I think, on his behalf. Will you rule out all store-bought sauces, tomato puree and um, keep food simple? One of the things to watch out for in a lot of those sauces is they have a huge amount of added sugar and additives like yeast extract and other various things like wheat and um, all of which the sugar is obviously going to be contrary to what we're uh, really advocating and then things like yeast extract, there's just generally a lot of additives in it. Once in a blue moon isn't going to be a train smash but I wouldn't make it the staple of how you're producing your diet. Yeah, it got, it got, uh habit to get into Stephen is checking the nutritional information on the back of it, looking at the ingredients and if sugar is typically listed in one of the first three or four ingredients, it's something you want to steer clear of because Barry's talking about it's going to trigger that insulin response and especially if you're eating sugar with fats is something that Barry's taught me about because insulin is that signal to the body saying store, and store stuff, store stuff and you're having it with fats, you're going to end up putting on a lot of weight. Yeah, there's another question here is, um, do you need to improve your strength if you're a natural climber with a good weight and you have a good VO2 max for spinning the gear in high cadence up a climb? Take Froome, for example. That was a particular workout that Sky put a lot of effort into was those uh, in the saddle efforts, Anthony, which do, do involve a lot of max strength. Yeah, and again, that's, even, that's back to reverse engineering the demands of your target event into your training. And that's something we do a lot of over the course of our training plans. Freum identified that this was going to be a, a point in races that was going to be quite pivotal, so they reverse engineered that into the training, and this is one of the core things we talk about. If you're not doing it in training, it's not going to magically happen on race day. Yeah, absolutely. There's another question here, and I'm sorry you asked this quite a while ago, but I'm um, just getting to it now. I've been working on VO2 and functional threshold power this year, but at only 50 kg and 5 foot tall, and yes, I'm a girl, I can't generate enough absolute power to stay with the guys in short efforts above 26 miles per hour, flat, neutral wind, what can I do or am I being unrealistic? I don't think you're being unrealistic at all. I think it's just a function of uh, working on um, those factors, Anthony. Yeah, Stephen, it's going to be working on threshold. It's going to be working on VO2 max. The principles don't change that much uh, depending on how light you are. You know, it's still going to be you coming through our system, ticking the boxes one by one. You know, and also just because you're 50 kilograms doesn't mean you aren't going to benefit from the nutrition stuff that Barry's talking about. Because the way he's talking about becoming fat adapted, that's going to give you extra energy and extra power at the end of races or when you need to dig in. Like when the guys are starting to roll a big gear, you're going to be able to hold them a bit longer when you start implementing this system we have. So another question came through, could you describe the difference between a function of threshold power interval and a VO2 max interval? Yeah, so a functional threshold power interval typically about 20 minutes and we can sustain this power for longer than 20 minutes if we had to up to an hour. A VO2 max interval is typically a lot shorter. We'll train at four minute capacity style intervals where you're going as hard as you can for four minutes. So a typical session for threshold would be one hour with two by 20 minutes zone four. A typical session for working on uh, VO2 max or capacity will be one hour with four by four minutes full gas with four minute recoveries. Okay, so I'm conscious of time. Um, we said we'd try and keep it concise. I hope you found it of use. Um, really, the principles that we've talked about in this webinar are the foundation stone of you making serious gains in your cycling over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, it's been a real blast. I'd like to thank Barry for coming on, Anto as always, uh, Aaron for producing uh, the information around strength and conditioning, and Steve as always for being uh, there as a support. Really grateful for everyone who's taking the time out tonight. And sorry for those that couldn't get on the live webinar. Um, unfortunately, we did say it was limited, and uh, un uh, uh, unfortunately, some of the people couldn't get in. But that's it. I look forward to uh, hopefully working with a lot of you, Anto, uh, over the next couple of months um, and building some even bigger, crazier success stories as we move towards uh, to the 
2017 season. Yeah, Stephen, there's already people jumping into the Facebook group here, so I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on the inside. Uh, so for those guys that signed up, I'll chat to you in there now, and I'm looking forward to being part of your narrative for the coming season. That's it. Thank you so much, and look forward to seeing you inside the group and on the private members' webinars. Take care. Thanks, Dave.